As the Roaring Twenties were drawing to an end, so too was an era of relative prosperity for many Americans. As early as 1926, the construction of new housing had decreased. Businesses had too much inventory and too few buyers. Nevertheless, an optimistic America wanted to believe that the good times would last forever, pointing to fortunes that were being made on the stock market. Even people with little money to spare wanted in on the action, and stockbrokers readily agreed to sell shares on margin, where they would lend citizens money to buy stock. These investors figured the stock's price was bound to go up and up, allowing them to pay back the stock's original price tenfold. The constantly rising price of stocks cast a spell over the nation. Noon hour traffic stood still as people eagerly awaited news of their improved finances. Even distinguished Yale University economist Irving Fisher made a bold speculation. The nation is marching along a permanently high plateau of prosperity. But the simple fact was that the price paid for many stocks was unduly out of proportion to the actual profitability of the companies who issued them, creating the illusion of increased value. On October 29th, 1929, reality finally caught up with the stock market, and what went up came crashing back down. Panicked investors sold 16 million shares in a single day, many for just pennies a share. Millions of other stocks went unsold entirely on that afternoon, known as Black Tuesday. In just a matter of hours, the stock prices took such a nosedive that any gains made over the previous year vanished. The market's collapse was the most distressing downturn in the history of the New York Stock Exchange. So distressing, in fact, a number of investors committed suicide rather than face financial ruin. Black Tuesday may have signaled the start of the Great Depression, but the collapse of the stock market wasn't the only cause of the nation's financial woes. The federal government of the 1920s had supported big business with low interest rates and very little governmental regulation, especially over the stock market. In turn, many businesses borrowed more money to expand than they could ever afford to repay. High tariffs that had kept American business owners happy because they kept foreign-made products out of the U.S. unfortunately meant many European countries were unable and increasingly unwilling to buy American-made products. For instance, Germany was barely able to pay the World War I reparations she owed, and high tariffs like the Hawley-Smoot Tariff Act passed by Congress in 1930 only made matters worse. The tariff's goal was to protect American farmers and manufacturers, but it backfired. America found itself unable to sell her farm goods and manufactured products abroad. World trade in turn faltered as foreign countries imposed severe tariffs of their own in retaliation. Many key industries were struggling even before Black Tuesday. Throughout the boom times of the Roaring Twenties, agriculture had been in a tailspin. The textile, steel, automobile, and railroad industries were also beginning to feel the pinch. As the unemployment rate increased, most families bought even less. The gap between the handful of wealthy Americans and the rest of the population got even wider. Even though most Americans had not profited from the economic boom of the 1920s, they bought many exciting new products and services during this era of unrestricted credit, living well beyond their means. The banking industry, too, was hard hit. Some banks had invested heavily in the stock market and helplessly stood by as that money vaporized into thin air. As Americans began to realize the pitiful state of the troubled economy, many panicked and rushed to withdraw their savings from banks. Many banks simply couldn't instantly produce the cash demanded and instead shut their doors, leaving depositors with nothing. Bank failures wiped out nearly 9 million individual savings accounts. 659 banks were closed in 1929, and by 1933, one quarter of America's banks had failed. 